They're very civically minded. G and K is people. And besides, uh, the other people are relatives? No. Who are? Nevins? Uh, no, shh. No. Don't mention it. No, they're, they're not relatives. I go fishing with one of them. Oh, oh, I see. Well, that explains it, because obviously... Well, if he once... buys the minnows, I should send him my yarmulke, <laughs> shouldn't I? <laughs> I mean, because once, once you send your cleaning to G and K, you will obviously never go to anyone else, and I, I'm just a little surprised, a man of your intelligence and standing in the community. However, uh, I, I can see where something like that with fishing and something. But uh, <laughs> you send your fishing clothes to that other place, and <laughs> you send right. your good things to that. <laughs> okay. But I was going to ask you: Aren't there certain robes in in, in the in the? Uh... No, <clears throat> they're no? not really. Although in uh, reform temples and uh, conservative synagogues, rabbis do wear robes. Um, of course, at the time of the temple, there were special robes for the priests, and there were especially special robes for the high priest. Um, they the, probably send them to G&K, because they have to be well taken care of. They're well, very, they would be a little old, I would say. A little old? Yeah, but they would be... Well, the last temple was destroyed a long time ago, so I would imagine the ropes would be rather oh. frayed by now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but the, the synagogues do use a prayer shawl called the talis, and uh, that, again, has undergone some changes in, in the past years. Uh, in the Orthodox synagogues, it's a long... Uh, square sort of a, a cloth that is worn uh, draped over the shoulders and therefore hang and hangs down practically all the way to the ground. Um, and in some Orthodox synagogues, the people wear them even over their heads during prayer. Uh, the idea of the talis was originally just this very idea that all men look in the sight of God the same. And that when you enter a synagogue, you cannot even see the difference between the rabbi and the, uh, and the layman, the banker, or the shoemaker, that all men, as they enter the synagogue, wear this talis in the sight of God. And I think it's a very beautiful idea because, idea. because it does not, you, you, people can't see whether you're wearing a, a suit that cost $150 or whether you're wearing one that you bought at a rummage sale. You still have the same talis. Now, unfortunately, so-called modern ideas have crept into the synagogue as they have in Christianity and uh, Mohammedism too. And today, some of the synagogues have these little, we call them mini tallers, you know, the little uh, <laughs> shawls over the, over the, uh, uh, just over the shoulders. And of course, there the idea of the tallers is lost because uh, not everybody wears it, and when they do wear it, they're just small, very small uh, tallers. Now, this is the, this is a, a, an original rope and, and a garment that is uh, supposed to be worn. Um, we had, there's biblical, uh, um, there is a biblical command of having fringes on our garments, and this is the one garment that has the, four fr the, the eight fringes on the four corners of this garment. When you go into a synagogue, you'll probably find people wearing it. Uh, the rabbinical cloak is something that Judaism has, uh, I don't want to say stolen, but has taken away from uh, Christianity that uh, the wearing of special clothes of the priest or of the uh, uh, pastor. And it was first introduced by the originators of Reform Judaism in Germany uh, very, very, uh, well, about a hundred, over a hundred years ago. And uh, I suppose it, the, the, the original idea was to impress the people that uh, uh, the rabbi is an important individual, etc., etc. Uh, the original idea of the rabbi being a learned individual uh, didn't make it necessary for him to, to parade in front of his congregation in a, uh, particular garb, in a particular garb. And so in Orthodox synagogues, uh, the rabbi does not wear any particular uh, clothes. In conservative and reform, they do. That's interesting. Say one more word about G and K. Oh, I forgot about G and K. Yeah. Didn't want to interrupt you there. Say, uh, uh, oh, just one thing about school clothes. Uh, this week, huh? Kids are out of school. Good time to get the wardrobe on. An excellent stuff. idea. And uh, you know, the uh, since many, uh, uh, you might want to use coin-operated dry cleaning machines for the uh, less dressy children's clothes. And uh, there are many, many places, including Colonial Square near Wyzetta, Jefferson and Pleasant, St. Paul. These drive-ins all feature them. Forty-seventh uh, Cedar, Minneapolis. Fiftieth and Penn, Minneapolis. During this holiday, a good time when the kids are home. So take them to G&K, either a drive-in or have the driver pick it up. It's now 12 minutes to 3, CCO temp. Time's flying. Yeah, boy. doesn't it? Too fast. CCO yeah. temperature is 16. We'll take this quick call. Hello, party line. Uh, well, each Thank of you the for weekends waiting. are so beautiful. 
and especially the cultural background of each of them. I'd like the opinion of the rabbi is um, if the uh, religions were taught in the public school, you know, more like history. Uh -huh. And I'd like his answer on that. Well, I think they should be part. I think there should be a course taught in high schools uh, giving some of the cultural background of the various religions. Um, of course, to, to do this and to prepare a curriculum like this is most difficult uh, because we don't want to infringe on the First Amendment, which would be, ch uh, which would be a challenge that many people would immediately uh, bring forth uh, against such a cause. But there should be a certain basic knowledge uh, in the uh, faiths, uh, the major faiths, let's put it this way, and perhaps even the, those that are not so well known. Uh, but I think the emphasis should be on two uh, uh, aspects. One that you mentioned, a knowledge of the culture and the background and history, but also the moral aspect of the faith and what it teaches us today. And I think uh, that this perhaps, the, a combination of those two things might be something worthwhile for the public schools. In fact, there are some public schools that do invite um, rabbis and others to speak to their classes in, um, I think it's under home economics or, or what is it called, family living. Family. family living, right. And they ask clergymen to explain uh, questions of intermarriage and questions of... Uh, uh, how do Jews look upon, or how do Christians, or how do Catholics look upon uh, this particular aspect of family living, the importance of religion in family living. And I know that many public schools, high schools, have invited me in the past and invited other rabbis to explain to the boys and the girls the peculiar aspects of the Jewish faith with regard to family living. This makes for better understanding and uh, oh, so yes. important. I so think we're very fortunate that we're living at an age when there is this... Uh, urgent demand of people who want to know, mm -hmm. who want to know the differences. And I think this is a, a really good sign of our times. With under understanding comes respect, and this is important. Right. Say, uh, just want to take a second, uh, talk about Butter Kernel, because so many people have become acquainted with Butter Kernel, I'm sure, over this past holiday, because of pumpkin pie mix mm -hmm. from Butter Kernel, right? And this isn't the only Butter Kernel uh, product at all. Oh, no. 27 many, many other products. Yeah, tw yeah, there are, aren't there? There are about 28 vegetables, yeah. And they're all grade A fancy. Now, uh, you know, we put emphasis on the fact that they are grade A, and uh, uh, that means they also are fancy or whatever. But there are three different that kinds of vegetables. That means the best you can grade, buy. Standard, extra standard, and grade A. This is and top of the crop. This, this is, is the very, best. This is it, right up there. Very best. And it's uh, canned right here. Field freshes, canned vegetables can be, so look for them. You should they see how taste. well fed these two fellows look here. <laughs> yeah. That's I think you've had butter kernel for lunch. Oh, <laughs> yes. With a little miracle white on top. <laughs> Party line. Uh, I wanted to ask the rabbi a question, if I may. Sure, go ahead. Uh, does the Torah consist of uh, books of the Old Testament, and if so, which ones? <clears throat> the, uh, the word Torah is used in different connections. Mm -hmm. uh, one is the, e the one most frequently used is the one that denotes the five books of Moses, uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And the reason why we refer to this as Torah most frequently is because the scrolls in the synagogue, in the Ark, are also called Torahs, and they contain all the words from the beginning of Genesis to the end of Deuteronomy. And therefore, the most common use of the word Torah refers to the five books of Moses. Uh, the second use of the word Torah is the, is the complete Old Testament, what you call the Old Testament. We call it the Bible. Mm -hmm. I've always frowned upon the use of the word Old Testament and New Testament and preferred the word Bible and Gospel. Right. Because New Testament or Old Testament is like a new refrigerator and an old refrigerator. You know, it doesn't sound too good. Right. So, <laughs> so when, we, when we use the word Torah, we, uh, we use it in, in the second sense as con uh, connoting all the words of the Bible, uh, all the books of the Bible, the prophets and the writings, book of Psalms, the book of Esther, and so forth. Mm -hmm. The third um, uh, meaning of the word Torah is the rabbinic literature that was compiled in the first few centuries or was completed in the first few centuries of our present era. And they, this is called the oral law, the oral tradition, because originally it was passed on from father to son and from rabbi to disciple. 
They also call this, or this is also called Torah. One is called the written Torah and one is called the oral Torah, although now, of course, it has been written down and is studied in the schools. And because all of these meanings are put together in our schools, when we study the five books of Moses, the Bible, and the oral law, our schools are called Torah Academy or Talmud Torah, which means places where the Torah is being studded. Talmud means this, is that right? I beg your pardon? Talmud, does that mean places? No, 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 no. Talmud means the learning or the, the studying learning. of, oh, yes. Uh -huh. Talmud Torah, the studying of Torah. Thank you for calling. Thank you. Thank you. Gee, I wish we had more time and evidence from the tremendous amount of calls we received. They're backed up on the switchboard and we can't answer them all. We should have you back more often than just on a holiday. Well, I'd be delighted to come back another time. We really should do that. We Fine. had uh, asked uh, uh, Rabbi Eisenman about a couple other things before the program, and we never even got to them. <laughs> so well, we'll have to leave. Are we through now? We're all the time is up. Well, I wish you a very happy holiday, and I think, I, I think many, many Jewish listeners who listen to you throughout the year, you give them a great deal of joy, and I'm sure that they join me in wishing you a very happy and merry holiday season. And same to you. Thank you. Thank you. News next on CCO.